Should we go? All right. Well, welcome back, everyone. Uh, again, I want to extend my thanks to the symposium leaders and to <coughs> Pepperdine. If you don't know me, I am Babette Bullock. I uh, am currently the chief economist of the Federal Communications Commission, uh, but I also, in uh, earlier incarnation, a law professor here at Pepperdine. So, welcome home to me. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> it's a real pleasure to be here on this group. Um, just as point of interest, how many here have an extensive knowledge of U.S. antitrust law? All right. <laughs> okay, Roger, put your hand down. Uh, Roger works for the DOJ antitrust division, so uh, I would hope you had your hand up. Um, who has a smattering of knowledge of U.S. antitrust law? That sounds like it. Okay, smattering. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> who is a Pepperdine I'm law student who has no knowledge of antitrust law? Okay, so you're <laughs> enrolling in my class next <coughs> spring. I'll see you there. Antitrust, well done. Uh, so uh, that gives us a lay of the land, everybody. So we're dealing with uh, a group who is new to some of the concepts of the law as it exists now, and a very current phenomena uh, which some have called populist antitrust. And this is a great panel to talk about that. I'm going to forgo formal introductions. Can, you can see it in your pamphlets, except to say on this panel we have a bucket load of BA degrees. MA degrees, one AB degree, whatever the heck that is, Jeff. Uh, three yeah. <laughs> University of Chicago being Oh uh, yeah, whatever. Okay. <laughs> three PhDs in economics and two JDs, and the creme de la creme, over 40,000 tweets. Yes, 116 of which were mine. You're welcome. 39,000 uh, of which were house. <laughs> So, uh, so we have had people who are very much engaged in these discussions, and so I am going to engage in what is known as hot potato routing and get to our panel as quickly as possible about the issue of the day. So I'm going to tee it up talking about, uh, as Carl Shapiro, who is a UC Berkeley economist, former uh, a DOJ, uh, professor, uh, DOJ um, economist uh, dealing with many of the issues uh, that we'll talk about today said, antitrust is hot again. Uh, not sure if that's a good thing, but indeed we're talking about populist antitrust. Some people talk about hipster antitrust or even EU style antitrust. And so I want to start about by talking about what does that mean? What is populist antitrust versus traditional antitrust, and exactly what is the populist movement uh, trying to solve? Are we concerned about uh, industry structural problems, uh, behavioral problems, concerned with innovation, or something else? And to tee up the conversation, I want to turn to Will and set the stage. Yeah, uh, thank you, Babette, uh, for all of this, and thanks everyone else for coming today, and obviously for Pepperdine for putting together this panel. Uh, there's a lot that's going on here, so I'm going to try to give a, a real basic overview of at least what we're generally talking about in kind of the family resemblances way. Um, there, there really seems to be a number of uh, names for what seems to be this kind of new trend in antitrust. Uh, some call it neo-Brandeisianism, which is, I think, Jeff's probably preferred term, or at least the one he uses a lot. There's Populist antitrust is sometimes what we talk about, or hipster antitrust. But really, there, there seems to be kind of some fundamental underlying um, trends happening both within the economy and also within the academic literature and, and, and in practice that, that seems to be changing, or at least potentially could be changing how, how antitrust as a policy uh, occurs and how it happens within the next, next 10 years and 20 years. And really, um, I'm going to leave it to some of the other scholars in the, you know, in this in this panel to talk about how we kind of came to this place. But but I think what's really important to at least start with is to mention that there is this sense that, that competition and especially um, concentration levels have been increasing for for some time. That really in the last 20 years we've seen something like 75% of all industries have had con higher concentration levels. So there seems to be, and you know, again, we're going to be discussing a lot of this, there seems to be much bigger firms that occur within the economy right now 
The big question is whether or not those larger firms are creating um, and are creating uh, you know worse prices for consumers or or how they're affecting competition. But generally speaking, we're trying to we're trying to understand how these concentration levels and kind of the the big bad question really works in today's uh, in it really in today's policy conversations. So uh, there's a lot to be said here, but I, I think that to really think through this, you need to think through what exactly it is that that competition policy is meant to achieve. Is it meant to achieve uh, benefit for consumers? Is it meant to uh, achieve benefit for innovation, which is a, a, a hot topic and really a, a, a topic that is really uh, obviously very complex to talk about? Or is it that we're actually trying to deal with something a little bit more, more fundamentally like a power problem or a political problem? You know, when, when we have these conversations and it'll come up very quickly, that we tend to talk about very large firms. We talk about Amazon and Facebook and Google and Apple. These are firms that seem to have not just, they're not just big firms, but they, they seem to also have a lot of political power. And so these things are naturally getting uh, involved with each other. Uh, I think I'm gonna probably leave it at that and because obviously we can go in many different directions, but what seems to unite uh, uh, populist antitrust, or at least this, this conversation is that Big is bad, and, and what I think that a lot of the panelists will probably start trying to tease apart is, well, what do we mean by this, and, and really how effective is, is antitrust and competition policy writ large in dealing with some of these problems that seem to be emanating from, the, from large concentration of firms? I'll open up for other comments. Go ahead, join. Well. <clears throat> That was a wonderful introduction to populist antitrust, so I'll take the next, maybe, um, turn, you know, to have a go at it. So I, there are so many ways this conversation can go because there's been a lot involved in the poly, populist antitrust discussion. Um, definitely, it's one issue is big is bad, what is big, you know, and how do you define big? Um, you know, and then the whole separate strand related to populist antitrust discussion is, you know, whether, you know, like Will mentioned, what is antitrust meant to, um, meant to do um, and meant to accomplish and whether antitrust should take into account, you know, things like, you know, other, other societal problems, things like income inequality or climate change or jobs and wages, right? So these are two separate strands and, and, and you know, I'll, I'll leave the second one a little bit later, but for now, maybe I'll, as an economist, I'll bring up sort of what types of evidence, what types of economic evidence we have seen so far from studies and papers, you know, on this topic um, and on this sort of recently on this topic and why this has gathered um, more interest um, in the last few years. So it started um, a few years ago uh, when we had, when we've seen studies and papers that talk about increases in concentration. Right? So increases in concentration to indicate that, oh my gosh, there's, you know, the firms are getting bigger and, um, you know, and, and, and structurally there are fewer firms increases in concentration and tying that you know, there's one particular study that ties that to, um, in particular, the fact that, you know, for example, if you look at the NAICS code, you know, um, you know, aggregate industries by six-digit NAICS code, then, you know, you observe that the top 50 firms have a larger revenue share, okay, um, of that industry, okay. So what does that tell us, I think, there's been conclusions that you know people have gotten to to say, wow, this means you know antitrust enforcement hasn't been adequate. You know uh, the DOJ and the FTC, or you know uh, the, the regulatory agencies on antitrust hasn't been uh, haven't been effective, haven't been effective in preventing concentrations from going up, and this is bad. Okay, so that's that's part of I think the way I view it, part of how it got, it got started. And then, you know, and then of course, you know, we have seen other evidence on that. So, so, so there are also people who are in antitrust who have asked questions about these type of studies. For example, you know, um, for 
for people who are either experts in antitrust or know a smattering of antitrust. You know, I think markets, relevant markets, is one of the things that come up a lot in antitrust. And so, you know, what are Nate six-digit NAICS codes the same as antitrust markets? Um, is that the right way of looking at, you know, of looking at increases in concentrations or revenue shares? Um, another, another, uh, you know, another question is, wow, and there are 50 firms, and, you know, and 50 firms within the six-digit NAICS code. Is 50 firms not enough? Is hmm. that too few? Um, I mean, how many of you, when you go out and shop, you know, competing brands and competing stores, how many of you consider 50 firms before you choose the firm that you go with, right? Probably not. And if it's not 50, is it three, four, five, and what is the right number, right? The answer is target. <laughs> and target them. <laughs> That's right. So, so there are a lot, basically there are a lot, just once you start to peel, you know, um, below the surface of this, you know, you think about what, so, so it's, it's a very, it's a complex question, you know, these, it's, a, it's a complex question, and it's much more, I think, complicated than looking at six-digit six NAICS codes. Um, not to say that six-digit NAICS codes and the data, you know, that's aggregated that way don't have its very, very helpful uses for, you know, for other things. So, so that's one thing. Another thing is um, we have, Another thing is, you know, in terms of, in terms of, you know, looking at these firms, you know, if, you know, one of the ways in which the reason why, you know, Wells, I hadn't mentioned this yet, but one of the reasons why this is called hipster antitrust has also been used is because it's talking about going back to the 60s and how things were looked at, how antitrust was back then, which is untethering the analysis from a consumer welfare analysis of you know, prices and output, but more of a structural analysis. Now, you know, what is a structural analysis? A structural analysis is mostly based on concentration, but also even more simply put, counting the number of firms, right? Counting the number of firms, one, two, three, four, five. Um, and then you, and then the next question is, so is, is four the right number? Again, five the right number, six the right number. Does it, should it, does it depend on which industry we're talking about, which antitrust markets we're talking about, and how competition works in those markets, right? And as an economist too, I would like to think about, you know, it not only should it vary depending on the industry, it should also uh, vary depending on how firms think about how they compete, right? How firms in particular industries think about how they compete. So standard economist models, you know, are we talking about a Cornell, are we talking about, you know, choosing capacities output, or are we talking about um, a return competition framework, right? And so, and how, how those, those models, which model is best fitted, suited to analyze the competition and how that works in a particular industry should come into play and, and, and counting number of firms simply just doesn't do it. So I'll stop here. I'm gonna to jump to segue to how I know this is uh, Joanna set up uh, uh, articulating a little bit more detail what's going on. The uh, any, traditional antitrust has been characterized by analyzing various conduct of companies vis-a-vis uh, -vis what is known as the consumer welfare uh, uh, standard. Uh, arguably, the neo-Brandeisians or hipster antitrust is looking at a much more structural approach, numbering and looking at uh, market structure uh, in a very sort of um, uh, mechanical way. And uh, how you've had some interesting uh, viewpoints on that that might point us a different direction. Yeah, thanks. And <laughs> let me try to frame this this up perhaps a little differently. Um, but but first, I'd, I want to thank the students for putting this together. Ashley, Nicole, um, this is really tough, and I appreciate you having me here. I think I'm here probably to speak to the possible solutions part of the subtitle, and Jeffrey is here to speak to the presenting challenges and obstacles and roadblocks. Um, so to, to you. <laughs> me in particular. Yeah. 
But uh, let me try to frame this up. And, and unfortunately, there's no one, no one on the panel uh, who represents the new Brandeisian view. And, and I think that if you haven't, um, if you hadn't had a chance to go through it, I would, I would put people like um, Lena Khan, who's a Yale law student right now, and Matt Stoller is at Open Markets, and uh, Marshall Steinbaum now at Roosevelt are, are the ones who are kind of leading, leading this charge. And, um, and, and the, the critique, and I'll try to do my best to, to put it um, you know, in, in, their, in their words, is that, um, or what I think they're capturing, is that the scope of antitrust has been considerably shrunk over time, in large part due to the ascendancy of the Chicago School uh, train of thought, which, which, was to, which was to really limit the ability to police restraints, and I'm thinking now more in, in terms of single firm conduct under Section 2 by, by monopolists as opposed to mergers, um, to, to only those, uh, those actions that, that result in a direct and tangible injury to consumers in the short run. And, 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 the, and the way that, uh, what, what animates, to, uh, animates a lot of antitrust litigation, and, and as an aside, and just to kind of toot my own horn, um, I, I, I have an antitrust litigation practice, and I serve as an expert in, in many, many cases uh, in this area. And what, what gets us going, what gets the cases rolling, is if, is if your, economic, your economic expert uh, is able to link uh, the restraint usually econometrically or empirically, to some tangible short-run injury to consumers, or if it's a monopsony case, uh, to, to workers. And, and the problem is that uh, there, 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 uh, there are types of harms, and we'll hopefully get into them. I, I like to uh, categorize them into a bucket of innovation harms uh, that, that uh, are difficult, if not impossible, to, to quantify and to document, let alone connect to the, to the restraint at issue in an individual case. And those, those, those uh, types of harms are largely going unpoliced uh, in the antitrust sphere. Some people say Section 2 is a dead letter uh, in the law. I think, that, I think that that's a bit harsh. Of course, you, you, uh, you, Section 2 does have some force, again, so long as the harm manifests itself as a short-run price or output uh, or wage effect or qu even quality effect. Um, uh, but, but I will say that you, you haven't seen, at least since Microsoft, which is now over two decades ago, you haven't seen um, any cases in what I would call the pure innovation, Section 2 cases that are enforcing, quote unquote, pure innovation harms. Uh, and so the, the new Brandeisian react to that by saying, let's change the standards. We, we recognize that, that it's, it's shrunk, and, and through an act of Congress, we will just have the standards change so that types of conduct that used to be policed but now go unpoliced uh, will, be, will be curbed. Um, there is a third uh, school of thought, and it's the one that, that I represent, um, and so I can't help but, but uh, putting it out there. And I have a, there is a senator who got, who got excited about it, and hopefully there will be more, um, and that's Senator Warner in his tech manifesto. And, and that is, let's, let's leave the consumer welfare standard alone and, and recognize that, that antitrust enforcement is just going to be limited to these types of, 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 of conduct that manifest themselves in a short run price or output effect, and instead attack the problem uh, outside of antitrust via regulation. And we'll get an, we'll get an opportunity, of course, uh, I'm sure, I hope, for me to talk about the, the possible solution. Uh, but but the, the analog, just as a pr quick preview of where I'm going, is that we had a very similar problem back in the 1980s where the dominant platform of that era, which were the cable television platforms, were leveraging uh, their platform power into the content space. And there's a big policy debate as to whether or not we should bar them from leveraging. Should we just put a structural barrier that says you, thou shalt not go into content? And Congress came up with what I think was a really smart uh, compromise, which is that we're going to let you get into the content game, but we're not going to allow you to leverage your platform in a way that artificially advantages your content over those of, of independent rivals. And the way that they did this was by imposing a non-discrimination regime. And I won't take up my opening right now to spell out how it go how it go down in the tech space, but that's that's what I've been peddling. It got picked up in Senator Warner's tech manifesto, and, and, um, and it is now uh, in, in the House, uh, Congressman Sicily from Rhode Island uh, appears to be a champion of the idea as well. I'll turn it over to Jeff. I'm not gonna even tee it up, yeah, Jeff, so, I know uh, you're. <laughs> 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 the big problem, I think, with the neo-Brandesian uh, approach, and also the one that you're advocating here, is, um, 
is the assumption of harms and the assumption that there's a connection between harms and the, the stated uh, or claimed problems in the case of the neo-Brandesians, it's, it's size or concentration, in your case it's, it's discrimination, um, and the assumption that, that antitrust can address them and actually create benefits greater than the harms. The problem is the innovation harm, let's start with that, that you talk about. You, you refer to it as a harm, but we have no evidence that there's a harm at all. You, could, you can describe in words what a harm could look like, but the fact that you can't prove it evi with evidence, the fact that you can't um, identify beyond a, a possibility theorem that says there could theoretically be a harm under certain circumstances here, is a very good reason for it not to be a cognizable harm by antitrust. That's not to say that it couldn't be, and by the way, innovation harms have been raised a lot since Microsoft, not without raising price as well, but why wouldn't you raise price as well? That doesn't mean that they, they don't think that the harm is really an innovation harm, it means they understand that they should raise all of the avenues they can in order to try to win at court. So I don't know that that proves your case. Um, the reality is the consumer welfare standard is meant to take account of a very multi-dimensional effects of allegedly anti-competitive conduct. Um, it's not limited to just, to just price, but some of them are really difficult and they should be difficult. And simply assuming that they exist and that a particular solution will solve them without creating greater problems than we have, than, than they, it solves, that's, I mean, that's just bad regulation, that's just bad policy. Um, uh, I, you know, I think over time you, it would be great if you could demonstrate somehow that there's a real problem here and that your solution would solve it. Um, but right now you're resting on the theory that there could be a harm from discrimination. And you point to, as you just did, the, um, the Cable Act. And as I pointed out to you before, but they haven't all heard it, so bear with me, you've heard it before. Uh, we fight a lot on Twitter. The Cable Act, so it's true that the Cable Act said, hey, we don't want you to engage in this form of discrimination. It is not true that the Cable Act was written by economists who very carefully studied whether prohibiting this form of discrimination would actually lead to net benefits to consumers. It was a political decision that said, we don't want it to look like this. Now, we all know that political decisions um, are the antithesis of good economic decisions in most cases. And there was, no re there was no impetus behind this one that was actually economic, of course. So the fact that you point to it and say, and say we do it here doesn't mean in any sense that you should do it anywhere else. It doesn't even mean you should do it there. Now, I, I'm going to talk about the Neo-Brandesians for a second because they, they have an even bigger problem, right? At least innovation is actually part of what we sh should and do care about under the consumer welfare standard under antitrust. The neo-Brandesians want to say, um, we have th these big companies create all of these other problems. Um, uh, they make labor markets look different than we would like them to look. Uh, they uh, lead to a, um, a loss of localism. Uh, our local communities are somehow decimated because a Walmart moves in and this is a problem that they ascribe to the size of the companies operating in these markets. And again, I question whether the connection has actually been made or not, but even more and more importantly, I question whether, um, whether we want antitrust to be taking account of, to, to be sort of solving those problems, alleged problems, um, <clears throat> both because they're completely idiosyncratic, right? It's not like price. I mean, everybody would like price, all else equal, everyone would like price to be lower. All else equal, some people would rather shop at Walmart than the more expensive mom and pop store down the street. Um, this goes back to the privacy conversation too, right? Privacy has also been incorporated into this, but people have very different views of, of privacy. If you start incorporating that into um, antitrust, um, in addition to the depth proof problems, because it's not clear that they're actually related to concentration or size, you have introduced essentially a limitless political influence in the process of antitrust, um, meaning you, you remove its power to actually um, uh, help the consumer, econo the economic welfare of consumers, and you introduce yet another avenue for political decision making. These decisions should be made by the political branches. Maybe we decide as a democracy, or whatever it is we are, that, uh, that we should have more smaller firms. Great, pass a law. The problem with the Neo-Brandesians is they've been trying to pass these laws for years. And someone, one of them woke up one morning and said, hey, it's not working in Congress, but look at this, 
really vague law here, the Sherman Act, we can use that. We can use that and make and we'll get all the stuff passed that we want by regulators because they're a lot easier to influence and control. Um, that doesn't sound like good policy in any way. Can I respond real quick? Uh, I, I keep it to a, sixty. Yes. Seconds. <laughs> yes. I, so otherwise, Jeff, otherwise, ten thousand tweets are going to come right after this. Yeah. Yeah. Jeff, <laughs> Jeff demands empirical proof of the innovation arm, and I'm just going to freely admit that we're never going to be able to we're never going to be able to, to quantify innovation. Some we don't. Evidence we don't I'm going to give you some evidence, <laughs> but we we we'll never know. We'll never know what what innovation how to measure innovation, right? What what are we measuring? Economists think in terms of like patenting activity. We just we just suck at measuring innovation. It's not something that lends itself to measurement. And, and, and we're never going to be able to connect one discriminatory episode to a, to a diminution in innovation. It's just, it's just incredible, right? And, but let me tell you about what evidence we do have, right? So there's a, there's a paper by, and this isn't the extent, but I'm going to go to the one that I like, which is ZHU, Z -H -U, uh, uh, Harvard. Um, You're not going to talk about his second paper. No, I'm, I'm not going to talk about his second paper, but we can go there. Not. Let's talk I'll about talk the Amazon about the second paper. paper. I know, Jeff's going to do it. All right. Um, the Amazon paper. The Amazon paper shows that Amazon has decided, uh, and they've gotten really heavy into it of late, but at the time that, that Zhu and his co-author were writing, they were just kind of sticking their toe in the water. But, but it, where Amazon decided that they were going to vertically integrate into the merchandise that they were selling and make basically a branded clone, and then steer their searchers uh, to, to their favorite device, right? And, and uh, Jeff and I think is with me that they're, they're, in a, they're in a position, if they want, to basically scoop up any ancillary revenues or any ancillary margins uh, that they, that's theirs for the taking. No. You know, if you control the platform, right, you have tremendous power over what, over where, where searchers go. You can move people out, you can move competitors down, you can, you can promote yourself in a one box. Um, and, um, and so what he found was he, he, looked at, he looked at episodes of invasions by Amazon into the edge, and, and he found that um, when you, when you looked to, to the, to the, uh, to the complementor who had, who had his product stolen or appropriated, that, that they had a statistically significant increase in leaving the platform compared to a control group of non-affected sellers. Right? That was the primary finding. And so, you know, who cares, right? Um, lower prices, yay. You know, Amazon is selling the cl their branded clone, and they're probably even doing it at a lower price. You know, who cares, right? What, 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 what are we worried about? What we're worried about is that if enough entrepreneurs at the edge uh, uh, get wind of what's happening, which is their, their best ideas are being appropriated by the platform, that they might eventually throw in the towel. And if they throw in the towel, we might suffer a loss in edge innovation. Why do we care about that? We care about it because we think that independents uh, are some of the best sources of ideas and innovations in the economy. And if they start throwing in the towel in sufficient droves, um, we might we might suffer a loss in innovation at the edge, and I, I I totally agree with Jeff on this point. My last point, I promise, it is not going to come from an econometric proof, right? The Cable Act protections began over a series of episodes of, of of discriminatory episodes. Home shopping was the famous one that I think sent it over the edge, where one of the cable platforms appropriated the idea, made their own home shopping network, and then made life miserable for the independent and steered all their users to to their to the clone. It, it, is not, it did not come about because of, uh, economists came up with an econometric proof. It came about because of a political <laughs> preference, which is a long tradition in this country, uh, which is that we care about independence, we care about small merchants, and we're going to create some breathing room for them so that they have an opportunity to survive and thrive. And if, and if it happens here, um, which I'm kind of hopeful and, and optimistic that it will. It, it's not going to happen in this context over an econometric proof. It's going gonna, it's gonna to come down to, to a political preference in which we believe that, we, that there's an important role to play for small merchants in our, in our society and in our economy, and we're going to create some breathing room for them as well. Um, I'm going to bring Joanna into this conversation as well. Uh, just as a, a little bit of background so that you can impress your friends at cocktail parties where antitrust inevitably comes up, um, uh, there was a reference by how to uh, uh, section 2 being uh, dead letter is referring to the Sherman Act. Uh, section 1 and Section 2 are the primary ways that we enforce our antitrust laws. And here you go. Sherman Act Section 1, it takes two. It's about cartel behavior and often deals with what is uh, talked about as horizontal behavior. In other words, among competitors. 
For Sherman Act Section 2, it takes one. So that's where we deal with sort of monopoly behavior and what is known as vertical restraints and vertical relationships, which also has a Section 1 as well, if it's not a, uh, unless it's a merger. So, uh, so that's to give you a little bit baseline. And also, Hal brought up this, and uh, again, implicit in some of his uh, discussion with Jeff, was talking about this concept of monopoly leveraging, which I know uh, Joanna has uh, also uh, knows a great deal about. But I want to bring you into whatever you want to talk about, but sort of tee that up as well. Thank you, mm -hmm. but, um I was going to uh, thank Hal for uh, for getting us all straight into monopoly leveraging. <laughs> <laughs> which, which is a dead letter. Monopoly leveraging, section two is a dead letter, too strong. Monopoly leveraging is a dead letter in okay. antitrust. Okay. So, um, and, and also, I think you brought up Amazon and um, um, uh, expropriation or, you know, um, all of that. I think these are all very interesting issues that are relevant to so many of us, right? I, I use, I'm a heavy user of Amazon. Okay, so, but I have, I have two questions about what you said. So one is you've mentioned these innovators, they bring on these really great mar uh, products and then Amazon taking their idea of making the generic version. Let's think about the generic version and selling them and then the innovators are leaving, not listing as much you know, anymore and so that's evidence for decreased innovation. So my question is where did those innovators Traders go? Did they drop off of the face of the earth? Did they leave the market or did they just leave Amazon? And if they did just leave Amazon, are there other places they could be going to, right? To um, As opposed to just disappearing from the face of earth. Um, and then to the extent that over time, right, you think about Amazon making decisions to make these and then and then co consumers will say, well, there's this cheaper, you mentioned the cheaper prices and, um, for Amazon, um, and, and people like that, but people also have the choice, right, to not use Amazon, go somewhere else where these innovators are maybe now listed on, and you know, there's other platforms that don't take their ideas nope, and nope, you know, expropriating nope, them. Nope. Um, so anyway, for this, you know, from the study that you were referencing, I was wondering, you know, what 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 evidence is there um, on that, and then and 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 you know why people can't go somewhere yeah. else other than Amazon. Okay, so what happened? The problem is that Amazon controls roughly fifty percent of e-commerce uh, in the U.S., and so the notion that and there's a, there's also a coordination problem. So I get I get blown up, mm -hmm. Amazon steals my stuff, and then starts directing directing their searchers, their users to the clone. You know, where do I go and how do I communicate where I'm going um, with, with Amazon's installed base of customers, right? But, but here's the most important thing. Don't, don't ask yourself, don't worry about where they went. They're suffering, right? Because you don't, have, you don't have 20 great blockbuster ideas in your pocket. You know, the typical entre entrepreneur is lucky to have one. And if, and if he or she struck it big, with that one, right? Now, now the question is, well, they've, they've got another one, just reach a little deeper, and, and no, it doesn't work that way, right? But don't worry, don't, don't ask yourself, what happened to the guy who got blown up, right? The, the, my story and the theory of harm is it's all the other edge providers or would-be innovators who are observing the appropriation. Right? That's the story. The story is that we, we are concerned that if they're, if they're observing this, and they see that their best ideas can be cloned and appropriated, not just by Amazon. I don't want to pick on Amazon. Google has gotten into the search results by giving their, for example, local search. Facebook is using a VPN to study what you do when you go outside of Facebook. Uh, I think it's called Anovo. And, and whenever they, they see that you're spending too much time outside of Facebook, they clone the app functionality and bring it inside of the mothership. Um, and, and they're many, many episodes of this document. I don't want to make this the Amazon show, right? It's all, all the platforms are doing it. Um, but I, I digress. The, the, the point is that the, the concern is that if, if there's too many folks on the outside, on the edge, watching the appropriation, right, if they, if they throw in the towel, right, that's, that's where the harm would take, that's where the harm would occur. And Jeff wants me to document the towel drops. And I'm telling you that we can't hear them. You know, when the towel hits the floor, mm -hmm. right, and someone gives up, some idea doesn't get funded, right? God doesn't make a recording of it not getting funded, right? These are silent towel drops. Gotcha. Um, look, at, look at the evidence we do have, though. Uh, Amazon, for example, <clears throat> is moving oh, in. Attack you from left and right. Is moving in. <laughs> 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 but, uh, I, I just 
<laughs> Quick on this point, exactly. Uh -huh. They're moving into the, the massively innovative mattress market yeah. and the double A battery market. And and Google is yeah. is is you know is moving into the I mean, you know, we're talking cutting edge comparison shopping market. Right. If these companies were really wanting to take advantage of innovations on their platforms, they wouldn't be behaving like they are. And and Facebook I, you know, is completely an opposite here because because they're not they're not incorporating anything that's on their platform at all. There's Correct. no discrimination there I, I at agree. all. And and what they are doing, of course, is is taking ideas. And by the way, maybe this all just means we have insufficient intellectual property protection, which I would also be sympathetic to. But I suspect zero Neo Brandesian would ever go anywhere near that. But um, if the problem is that they can appropriate intellectual property or or you know. Um, ideas from others, um, you have to acknowledge, even if there's a cost, that there's a benefit too. That when Facebook implements some interesting um, new innovation, it benefits Facebook's three billion users. When when some edge provider that has a hundred million users does this, it 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 yes. harms, but of course doesn't harm because there's no exclusivity here. A hundred million users. Now I'm not saying that that necessarily outweighs. I'm just saying it makes even harder your ability to say that there is a clear uh, and obvious harm here because you, you assume that improvement of the platform can't be as valuable as improvement or, or the possibility of improvement at the edges. And I, I don't think that's true, nor would you argue that in the net neutrality context. Uh, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Dwoskin of the Washington Post interviewed, she says, two dozen uh, Silicon Valley um, investors. And um, they, they unanimously named appropriation of app functionality by Facebook as the number one cause uh, for them not funding startups uh, in, in this space. And so the first question that they ask an investor is, how are you going to protect your idea from being appropriated by Facebook? And if you don't have a good answer to that, you're going to get... Uh, you're going to get your funding pulled. And just one, one, one other quick point. Uh, the consumer welfare standard, right? The consumer welfare standard would celebrate Jeff and I sp spending the night outside of uh, Wal what we like to talk about, Target. We'll go to Target. Yes. Right? And a delivery yeah. truck coming Very up. Very upscale right? in Malibu. A delivery yeah. truck coming up, and Jeff and I tip the damn thing over, and all the goods spill out, and then, and then it gets looted by everybody on the street, right, in the store. Uh -huh. and, and consumer welfare skyrockets that evening, right? Because they're getting the goods for yes. zero. Yes, we all as we a, celebrate as, that. Yes, we do Absolutely. celebrate, Jeff, because consumer <laughs> welfare, clearly if consumer welfare, consumer welfare, yes, if consumer welfare is, 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 is the guiding light, then by that measure, we ought to just be jumping for joy because these customers would have had to pay the market price for the goods, but that night, they were just lucky enough to be standing around to get it, to get it for the loot. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, would say, I would say let's call on some Pepperdine students to s easily refute that craziness. No, the Pepperdine yeah. students recognize that there's a dynamic aspect to the story, right? They're smart kids. I recognize there's a dynamic right. aspect too. Yes, I, I won't say that they're, that's similar to some stories in Brooklyn. Um, <laughs> I, I do want to put, we've, we've talked a little bit about laying out the groundwork and, and what the debate is. We've talked a little bit about monopoly leveraging, which is the way antitrust works. We look at conduct, and monopoly leveraging uh, might be one of the conducts or, or discrimination that we might be concerned about. Uh, vertical restraints, we've, we've kind of talked briefly about uh, how a firm works vertically, and that's sort of the investment story that, <laughs> that just went through. So we're looking at conduct. So antitrust by its nature is ex post, uh, not ex ante like regulation. And so I wanna bring in, uh, I'm gonna start again with Will again, to get the full story of antitrust. One of the things is not just identifying those harms and identifying that conduct, but uh, formulating a remedy, an antitrust remedy, which can solve the problem before you. And so uh, the question is just in general, um, how good are antitrust remedies uh, in general? And then second, uh, dealing with some of these issues. I know that uh, Hal already mentioned the you know, you might want to come out with a law saying you want to protect small businesses. Uh, arguably, antitrust was used for that purpose um, long before. As uh, an American working woman, uh, I shudder <laughs> because uh, going to the butcher, the baker, and the candlestick maker in my already busy, busy day sounds horrifying. <laughs> I mean, I'm not French, good gosh. Uh, you know, <laughs> uh, I have a job to do. So, um, <laughs> 
Uh, so that might not be consumer welfare enhancing, but what kind of remedies do we have? Are they functional and can they reach some of the concerns that are being raised here? So yeah, um, to set that up, I, I actually just want to recount probably one of my favorite little sections from a book um, all about cigarette sales, which is called The Cigarette Century. So this is, uh, this is actually right after the American tobacco breakup, which is probably not very, it's not talked about very much, but I think a really, really interesting case uh, and specifically, Alan Brandt, who's a historian, was say, said this about you know the end of the breakup and then kind of the restructuring of the market. It was it was one thing to identify monopolistic practices and activities in the restraint of trade, and quite another to figure out how to return the tobacco industry to some form of regulated competition. Even those who applauded the breakup of American tobacco soon found themselves critics of the negotiated decree restructuring the industry. This would not be the last time the tobacco industry would successfully turn a regulatory intervention to its own advantage. This is probably, again, a great book. You should actually check it out. It's pretty cheap on Amazon right now. It, it talks, <laughs> interestingly enough, I'm sure Hal loves that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, needless to say, this is, I think, a really, it, it's an interesting case that, again, we don't talk about all that often, but in fact, kind of highlights some of the structural components of, if, if we were to go down some of the, the, the breakup conversation that has been talked about. So, I mean, you know, underlying a lot of what we've been saying so far are some of these remedies, and one of the one of the most the, one of the strongest remedy currently is to say break up Facebook from Instagram or from WhatsApp or even from its own advertising platform. <laughs> these are pretty, uh, I would say, pretty onerous structural remedies to deal with a very uh, complicated and nuanced, even as we were talking about here, question around competition. But some of the best work that I think that we've seen, and especially the FTC has done a lot of really, really great work on, on retrospective uh, merger analysis, which is, again, a bit of a slight different conversation, you know, because we're talking about single firm competition as compared to, you know, retrospective merger analysis. Uh, needless to say that, that a lot of retrospectives find kind of uh, uh, ambiguous effects. You know, they're, they're highly contextual. One of my favorite uh, reviews of, of the, the, the Maytag Whirlpool merger actually found that it led to increases for, for dryers, but a decrease in washers. Uh, hospital merger reviews are highly contextual, even in even for a you know for for a uh, hospital group, depending on the commercial insurers. So it seems that there's some at least importance within the kind of upstream suppliers and the network in which the the hospitals exist. Post-merger price effects have been found, you know, in a number of different places, including academic and legal journals. But then studies of, say, the drug industry and oil sector have found kind of null effects. So this is obviously a, a hot issue that is hugely important as, it, as well within this, which is that okay, say we do have a whole bunch of these of these remedies, how effective are they? And again, we're typically talking about price increases or quality increases, but. At, at the end of the day, I do worry about our ability to see a market as we're trying to deal with it and trying to apply some, some specific remedies. And then the kind of, you know, the, the, the look 10, 15, even 20 years afterwards in which that industry is still affected pretty massively by that, uh, by that case. We've hinted it at Microsoft. Uh, Microsoft is, is this really interesting case. And I know, obviously, you worked extensively on this. Um, Microsoft, you know, people often look towards Microsoft as being the case that allowed the internet to bloom, and yet I, I'm really, 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 uh, that's a really, I, I'm, I'm hesitant to even claim that is the case. Microsoft, even as a, as a firm, was very dedicated to, you know, the, the, the PC culture, and it had its own kind of firm, firm dynamics and firm, uh, I think probably the best way of saying it is its own firm inertia. And so in, in some very key ways, and again, we could probably talk about this if we really wanted to, that 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 ability to take uh, to take control of another market is is specifically the the kind of the internet industry is is just very 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 di was very difficult at least from a firm perspective. Uh, all of this is to say there's a really is a lot going on here, and the remedies themselves don't always seem even if we can specifically point to a problem with the structure of the industry that that the prices particularly are too high that even our ability to to solve those through remedies are, are suspect, and I think we should be very suspect of, of any uh, unqualified uh, statements about the ability to, you know, kind of re-engineer these markets. I know that Hal is chomping on the bit, but I'm going to invite questions, so think about that. I would like for a student to go first. 
I still remember your names and how to cold <laughs> call. So, <laughs> anyone? Okay, non-student. <laughs> I will ask you, if possible, to come forward to, there's an X here and here, it helps with the live stream. So if you'd be so kind to walk on down, and while you are walking, I will give Hal 20 seconds. Nice. <laughs> I was gonna talk about the efficacy of, of the remedies that, that I'm proposing in the cable space. We've had, we've had about five cases litigated under this non-discrimination standard, and um, a lot of these are my cases, but go, go look up NFL v. Comcast, Tennis Channel v. Comcast, Masson, which is the Baltimore Orioles v. Comcast. Um, I'm no longer invited to the uh, Comcast annual uh, Hanukkah party. Mm -hmm. um, and GSN, GSN v. Cablevision. Um, but but uh, in two of these, NFL and Masson, we secured settlements. Uh, we got broad carriage as a result. And two, we got to findings of discrimination, one against Comcast and Tennis Channel, and another against uh, Cablevision uh, when we did it for GSN. And, and in terms of uh, what's going on uh, in the world of in innovation, around the time of, I'll make the 10 seconds, around the time of the intervention, we had about 30 odd independent cable networks. This is in the late, in the, in the early 1990s, we had about 30 odd cable net, independent cable networks. Flash forward just five years after, we had about 130 independent cable networks, and today we have over 400. Now I'm not, I, I cannot claim that that the intervention was the call. No, yeah. no, well, hold on, what I did, Jeffrey. <laughs> oh my God, I looked at the growth um, in the cable-affiliated cable networks over the same time period, and the, and the growth among the independents have out, has outpaced the growth. Now, that's not proof, again, of causation, but it does suggest that we've had a pretty wonderful result. If, if our measurement is stimulating innovation at the edge and creating space for independents to grow. On behalf of Jeff, I'm going to reserve two minutes, yeah, that's what we're trying to do. and then we'll uh, go ahead and, and ask our question. Okay, so my first question is for Mr. Singer, and then <laughs> and that is, so you the said that yes. the premise of antitrust law, key premise, is to reward or protect the small business. Is that... Did I hear you correctly? I think the new Brandeisian feel that that, that was an original um, intent to disperse economic power, to use their words, and that they feel that we've gotten away from that intent via the ascendancy of the consumer welfare standard. Okay, so I'm reminded of a biblical phrase, which is, do not favor the poor man in his cause, and that's followed by justice shall thou pursue, justice, justice shall thou pursue. And it seems to me that that protection of the small businessman uh, is completely contrary to that concept because it's social justice really. Social justice is nothing more than really than redistribution of wealth, socialism. And that's contrary really to capitalism and or according to the biblical phrase, justice. So I'm asking, my question to you is, does that biblical phrase or that influence of the, uh, from the Bible affect your belief or, uh, um, or that of uh, whether you would agree with the neo-Brandesians. That's number one. And number two, for any of the panel on the question, any of the people on the panel, my question is, could you make a case that we shouldn't have antitrust law at all? Are, are my beliefs informed by what's in the Bible? I, I would say I'm, I'm, I'm a non-practicing Jew, so I, I don't think I've been very good. Um, but I am, I am speaking at the University of Haifa Law School uh, in March. It's going to be my first trip to Israel. But I, I think that um, I think that you have to, setting aside the, the, the core values of the Bible, let's talk about what, what I think the, the, uh, the intent of the FTC Act and, and the Sherman Act was, and, and that was to disperse uh, concentrations of economic power, and, and not necessarily towards a particular favored class. Uh, although, when you read some of the history, it does seem to suggest that they Absolutely. had an eye, they had an eye towards small merchants. I think there was a constituency Certainly there, smaller. right? And um, and that was the that was the intent. I'm not I, I'm not um, I, I kind of want to stay agnostic, and I don't want to be normative as to what what should be. I'm kind of talking about if you accept that that's an important value, this notion of dispersing power and giving breathing room for small businesses and, and, um, and independence, uh, then we can have, a, we can have a, a help, a respectful conversation as to how to get there. There's a camp, the New Brandeisian, who want to do it via the Sherman Act, via adjustments to the Sherman Act and making changes to the consumer welfare standard, the standards 
uh, via antitrust. And then there's another camp, is the camp that I'm in, that wants to get there uh, using a template that had been used uh, to, to address what I think is a nearly identical problem in the cable space. Is that it? That answers it. And I'm going to give it to Jeff. Uh, well, I, I think to some extent, uh, I'm, you know, I'm not an originalist. I, I don't really care what the original intent of the Sherman Act was. That was a function of its place and time, and most importantly, the, the political influences, which were, were significant. They weren't the whole story, but certainly that was part of it. And, and in your question, you used the word pr protection. And I think that's the right word. And the you know the real problem with with returning, if that's what it is, or or implementing um, a, a a vision of antitrust that entails the protection of certain favored classes of of business, whether they're delineated by size or industry that they're in, uh, or um, you know what state they hail from, or whatever else, is it, it's the introduction of. Uh, or I shouldn't say the introduction because there's plenty of politics in politics now, but it is certainly um, an invitation for rent seeking and an invitation to ensure that the outcome of the decision making um, isn't grounded in any way in anything we'd recognize as, as a sort of um, you know, rigorous, whether perfectly empirical or not, uh, analysis and, and becomes just a, you know, implementation of the idiosyncratic preferences of the people who are doing the enforcing, assuming they can get a court to go along, which they would if the statute changed. Um, that doesn't sound like a, an improvement to me, but I understand the idea behind it. And again, if we have a you know, collective will expressed through our, our representatives uh, uh, to enact a law that says, you know, let's give 50% um, tax breaks to all small businesses. Oh, I think we do have a law kind of like that, don't we? They get tax breaks, don't yep. they? Yeah. So, I mean, okay, we, we favor small businesses and we do it through the tax code. Um, then that's fine. I mean, I, I don't necessarily agree, but I, I, you know, how could I oppose that? And, and what's interesting about this, I think Will raised this early on, is what's interesting about all of these conversations around neo brandesianism and, and antitrust populism, we have them in this antitrust context, but really, these are, <laughs> these are political totally. uh, economy questions. These, yeah. are, these are questions that no one up here is qualified to talk about, really. None, maybe will. Um, uh, really, I mean, if we want to have this conversation right, we should be having, this conversation should be had among political scientists and, um, uh, and you know, consti uh, cons uh, constitutional economists and, and the like. And it's not, it's not an antitrust question at all, except by convenience, I believe. I think, because they think they have an end that they want, and they found a mechanism that they think will get it to them. But otherwise, this isn't an antitrust issue at all. I, it's oh, one okay. small comment about the small oh, firms. Yeah. Uh, if you want to actually try to support small firms, you know, as Jeff mentioned, there's a whole bunch of ways that you could do it, which we do a lot of. Small Business Administration has low, you know, low interest loans. <coughs> there are state and local entities of which my father was a, uh, was an economist doing work that support, you know, sm small local businesses from starting and then, you know, potentially growing. I guess if you're trying to, if you're trying to support small firms, there's a whole bunch of other ways to do it. Uh, you know, you could just give out just money. You know, we haven't talked about subsidization at all, and yet it's something that a lot of other countries do. I don't want to say they do it well, but they do it. You know, it's it's an option. There is a whole range of other options that we you do. don't necessarily have to. Well, yes, we we do it, but not in the. Usually it's a large company. Yes, no, but. No, what is Solyndra, right? Yeah, you got children. Yes. Children. Tom, Tom, had a, <laughs> Tom had a question. Over yeah, there, by we're the way. gonna. Okay. Yeah. Well, you so that just, I guess my point is, is that there's other ways to get at this. If you're trying to support small firms, there's a whole bunch of other ways to do this. And I'd much rather us to have that kind of conversation about subsidizing small firms, which, you know, let's have that conversation than necessarily trying to uh, achieve it through a, a very convoluted and probably not as effective approach through the markets and it, or through competition policy. And I would say that this is, when you do look at, for example, you know, who's, Perhaps we aren't to trust the OECD, but the OECD has done a lot of reports on concentration. They, I think they do probably some of the best work in this space or have done some of the best work in this space. And this is constantly one of their, uh, one of their suggestions is supporting, the, supporting small businesses, not necessarily through, through the antitrust approach, but through subsidy approach. And, and that at least says something. Right, speaking of expertise, Tom Hayslick. Oh, <laughs> she, she don't touch! All the bite. Don't touch! <laughs> so, I didn't know you recognized me. Okay. Um, so, uh, 
there, there's these stories about foreclosure, just like predatory conduct, are very easily made. And then you have to go out and look in the marketplace to see if that's actually happening in the context of the actual evolution of the marketplace. Uh, it, it's clearly, by the way, not the case. And, and uh, I'd love to give this, I've written it down to give a test in, in law and economics that it's an increase in consumer welfare to have uh, uh, theft or uh, some kind of uh, vandalism uh, uh, redistribute products. So it's called rent seeking, and there's going to be a lot of reaction uh, to the rent seeking that are very costly for society. So that's not an increase. But the, uh, the fact is that Amazon's platform is hugely valuable to small business creation. Most of the products sold on Amazon are they're independent third-party sellers. Of course, eBay is a huge platform, basically all independent third-party sellers. These kinds of, of innovations come into the marketplace. You can have a story about foreclosure, but you have to look at it in context. Well, con uh, economists have done a lot on vertical foreclosure. You read the survey articles, they conclude that the vertical integration and the vertical relations that are actually observed are almost entirely efficiency enhancing. Very few stories. Now, I'm actually cited on some of the predation literature showing that in some cases you can have predatory conduct that looks anti-competitive, uh, but, but it gets cited because there's so few examples. And I'd like to talk about the one example I think you gave our favorite example, Hal, on home shopping. You think that home shopping was foreclosed by vertical integration and cable. The founders of home shopping, Roy Spear, became a billionaire. He was not foreclosed. Home shopping is still there. Now, QVC is a much better company, and it has done much better, but they're there, they're competing. There is a lot of vertical ownership at various times in QVC and home shopping, and that's been very beneficial to getting them in the market and providing competition in a better space. It's very hard to improve these kinds of processes with antitrust. We know that because we see what antitrust has done. In fact, if you want to look at a great case that uh, did exactly what you're saying, it was Microsoft, US v. Microsoft, in saying Microsoft had taken over this ancillary market, that uh, he was afraid from, from the competition from Netscape, and the Netscape with job embedded was actually going to be a threat to the underlying operating system. And there is consensus, even amongst those who are advocates and champions of the case at the time, that, that the, the case was, was not in the public, it, in, and the government won, by the way, terrible defense of Microsoft, by Microsoft, and the remedies were completely ineffectual. It, it disrupted the market a little bit in terms of Microsoft's operations and attention span and so forth, but they did not usher in competition. There was not, uh, competition has come in browsers and many other, you know, search, search engines certainly, uh, but, and you know, everything shifted to the mobile space from the desktop. That happened without the Microsoft case and any of the remedies being effective. So getting rules in place that are better than the Sherman Act of 1890 is still the agenda item here. And there has to be evidence that's going to show that it, consumers are going to improve their, their lot under a consumer welfare standard. Unless you're anti-consumer, which by the way, Louis Brandeis was explicitly anti-consumer, did not want consumers to get lower prices and better products. He wanted to support inefficient small businesses and worthy dealers uh, at the expense of the consumer. Unless you're going to take the anti-consumer attitude, you have to go with, with, with what we've got, the tools of antitrust and the economic analysis that purports to show that there's going to be actual consumer welfare gains. Here, here. Oh, and uh, is, there, is there a question? And the, your question should be, and, and, and Jeff, yeah, you agree speech. with me. The question <laughs> is, isn't that family. right? Isn't that right, <laughs> Professor Singer? <laughs> Can I, 30 seconds? <laughs> sure. You, <laughs> As always, once Tom speaks, we lose control of the panel, so. <laughs> well, we should just have Tom. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The, I think the question is, why uh, weren't you on the panel? <laughs> so. There, there are some serious folks, Tom, who think that the Microsoft uh, litigation at least uh, distracted Microsoft to a certain extent to uh, give some breathing room for Google and others to come in. But, but let's set that aside. If, if what you're asking is don't use antitrust as the vehicle to, to pursue this agenda, remember, I'm kind of with you here. I'm not, I'm not seeking to use an antitrust tool to get at the to get at this breathing room for independence in the content space. That's not, not where I'm going. Really quickly, on the, on the literature, um, 
and I have to toot my heart. You know, the, the literature on vertical integration is mixed, I grant you that. There's a really nice article by a guy named uh, Caves and Singer that shows that vertical integration in regional sports networks led to significantly higher prices. Significant, significant? Statistically that significant. That significant. Statistically really? significant, yes. Jeff. But, but was it what, 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 what kind Hold of on. magnitude? And, but the point, Tom, is that, is that, again, economists, as is the Consumer Welfare Center, are fixated on measuring, measuring welfare narrowly through the lens of, of prices. That's what that literature speaks to. And, and I don't think you're going to go into that literature and find a lot that speaks to whether or not um, we've been able to, to, to address or affect uh, innovation harms. A, a lot of that literature does address that. I mean, you're, of course, those are, it's harder to see those things. And, and, and economists you know, often will look where the data is. And, and there's a lot more price data than anything else. But you know, take, for example, the, the, the discussion around the effects of the Paramount case, the block booking case. Um, I, I, as I recall, right, the, the analysis that says that was a stupid intervention um, uh, is not just about price, it's actually about the quality of the films that were released and, and how many theaters were showing them and, and their geographic mm -hmm. dispersion and the like. So, I mean, and I'm sure there are other examples too, I can't think of them off the top of my head, but I, I don't, I, of course, it's predominantly price because that's where the data is, but I don't think that any, no one who's, who assesses that literature would say that's the only thing that matters. That's absolutely a caricature of of the you know the position that I I and the, the position that's being attacked by the Brandesians is is absolutely a caricature. It's, it's of course it's not the case that only price matters, um, but it may be the case that price matters enough and there is data enough data there that we can you know for the most part expect to to see enforcement happening around price okay. and expect price to be a fairly good um, uh, proxy for for everything else, and otherwise you're really just you're just speculating, completely on either side. I mean, because you're not going to have the evidence that you would need to prove your case, that, which is why you advocate a tribunal with a different standard, um, because you know you could you could never meet the burden of proof that would be required in court. But there's a reason we have those burdens of proof. It's to avoid people you know being successful at bringing cases that shouldn't be brought. And and I, I you know I admit that that's a hard problem in, in in an instance where where proof is difficult that could lead us to under enforcement, um, but I think the I mean, sadly I think the burden is on you and and again as how, as um, as Tom said if you focus on the the consumer and consumer welfare more narrowly more consistently um, you know I think you'll capture the vast majority and avoid the likely problems of over and politicized enforcement. Well, I agree that consumer welfare standard also uh, includes things such as hunger. Uh, so we're going to wrap this up and thank our panel as we go on to lunch. But thank you so much for a lively discussion. And I hope that we've seeded some thoughts and you'll investigate further on your own. And that you all so, take that class. <laughs> and you take my class. So thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, really quick, uh, one note. If you're, sorry, if you're attending the symposium for MCLE credit, uh, can you please return your activity evaluations to the MCLE desk um, where you entered at the end of the symposium and keep the certificate of attendance? I just wanted to clarify that. Um, and then we're going to take about 20 minutes to go outside and get lunches. Um, and then if you could be back in here, uh, we'll get started with the keynote. So thank you so much. Enjoy.